Dementia Life, a monthly podcast created by Dementia Action Alliance. I'm your host, Chuck McClatchy, and I'm living with dementia, uh, life with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, during this podcast, we will have conversations with inspiring people living with dementia and the people who care for us. I am so excited to have uh, Harry Urban today, who is living his uh, life with Alzheimer's and who is a phenomenal uh, woodworking artist. So Harry, why don't you tell us just a little bit about yourself and then I have some, some questions for you. Thank you, Chuck. I'm so, uh, I'm so thankful that you invited me here. Uh, my name's Harry Urban. I live in Pennsylvania. Uh, I was diagnosed with dementia of the Alzheimer's type 14 years ago. And it's been an up and down struggle for me, but um, you have to find a passion in life. And when you find that passion, uh, all the ups and downs of Alzheimer's doesn't matter anymore. Well, good. Now, when I, I, I'm, so, I'm so amazed that people, and I've talked to other people about this, that can take an image in their mind and tra transmit that down to their fingers and have it work. What first made you pick up a, a, a gouge or something and start woodworking? I started woodworking, actually, I was probably in my teens at the time. And um, over the years, I picked up the skills and I got better and better at it. And um, I started making furniture. And I made, I made several pieces of furniture for Christmas. I love making Christmas gifts and giving them away. I never sell anything because that takes the love of my hobby away from me, it becomes a job. So I never sell anything. I just always give something away. Uh, then when I was diagnosed with Alzheimer's, everybody was telling me, Harry, you can't do that anymore. It's unsafe. And I believed them. And, but there was a, there, there was a hole. I was missing something in life. And I started getting back into woodworking. Now, uh, obviously, I can't use the power tools I used to use, you know, because that would be unsafe for me to do. But there's so many things I can do, and I still get the satisfaction that I want. And I think that any any woodworker, um, they don't they don't do the woodworking for to end up to say, hey, look how beautiful this is. They do it because of that special feeling they get when they put that finish on the wood and that grain jumps out for some reason, my eyes sparkle. You know, that's why I do woodworking. And it, it gets to a point you make so many woodworking things that you run out of space. So I give them away, you know, and people's always saying to me, Harry, can I buy something off of you? And I always say no. And I say that because it, it would become a job. They would take, they would take the love of woodworking away from me and I would be doing it for money. And I never ever want to do that. Wow, that's awesome. Uh, a question I want to ask you as an artist, when you have something in your mind that you want to create and you're looking for a piece of wood or, you know, to, 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 to complete it, what do you look for? Do you actually kind of see your, your sculpture in the wood? Or are you just looking for a, a certain type of wood? How do you, how do you go through that process? I could never plan ahead. Okay, now, let me show you something. I'm gonna show you this. Uh-huh. Okay? Now that, that's, that's a pretty nice gift to give out. Yes. That is nothing more than a, a block off of a pallet. 
a friend a friend of mine gives me um, gives me some pallets, and and he he also has Alzheimer's, and I got him I got him started on woodworking, and he's just he's just a beginner, but he he's doing he's doing some nice things, and um, I got him hooked on making things out of pallets because they're readily available and most places will give them to you. And to be honest with you, I do that because it breaks my heart when somebody has a beautiful piece of wood and they throw it in the trash or they, or they burn it. You know, to me, that's wrong. So anyway, he got, he got a bunch of pallets and, um, the runners on it, he cut, he cut up in the blocks and he says, I don't know what to do with these. So I, I told him, I said, you can do so many things with them. His, no, I do wood turning and I use a mini lathe. Okay. And that's another block that he gave me and I put on the lathe and I turn it down. Now that these make wonderful gifts, and there's no expense to it. There's there's very little danger in it. You know, people say, "Oh my goodness, I, he has all time. He can't use a lathe." Well, I gave up my big lathe simply because. There's too much temptation to do something above my ability. You know, my heart says I can still do it, but I have to be, I have to stay safe. So I, I traded that in for what they call a mini lathe, which is a much smaller lathe. And um, it kind of restricts me on the size of stuff I can do. Like my other lathe, I could, I could take a tree and put it on that sucker and turn it down. Well, those days are gone. I can't do that. And I have I have a, a bunch of stuff here to show you. I don't know if you want to see them or not. Oh, please do. Yes. <laughs> I love. I had a I I had a tree cut down in my backyard uh, because uh, insects got to it, and it had to be cut down. So I got a piece of wood now i love i love getting wood that has that's different that's what i look for when i um when i'm going through and i say hey i want to make a snow globe i had no idea what the base is going to be like i know i can go to ac Moore and get the globe and the and the things in it and can put some snow on it and that part's done but i put that on the lathe and I started turning it and I see what the grain looks like. And I let that dictate to me the shape of it. And I've, I found out that you don't have to be fancy. You don't have to have delicate cuts and things like that. If you let the wood, everybody notices the wood first. They don't know the detail. They care less about the detail. That's why I'm saying somebody with dementia can do this. It's, it's so simple to do. Then, I got, I got a little bit creative too. And actually, I put that jar at, um, at one of the craft stores and they were on sale for 50 cents. Okay. And I got I took some burlap and I put these stickers on it. And I said to, I said to my wife, I said, hey, honey, look what I made you. And she was thrilled to death. And I, I probably did it in less than half an hour, you know, but, but uh, it brought a smile to her face and that's all I wanted to do. <laughs> here's, here's another piece that I wanted the I wanted the wood. 
you know, so um, now we don't burn a lot of candles because I forget that the one. So we use a lot of the um, uh, battery operated ones and things like that. But you know, that's another that's another piece of the tree out of my back from my backyard. And I got one more to show you. A friend of mine, she works at a, um, I don't want to call it a lumber yard. They, they make something, but, but they use a lot of mahogany when they make their stuff. And she said to me one day, she says, hey, she said, we have, we have a lot of scraps that we just get rid of. And I went, what do you do with them? She said, well, we put them in the trash. I said, oh, no, 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 never do that. So anyway, she gave me a box full of mahogany, and I ended up making this. I call it a button bowl, okay? And the idea, I get a lot of my ideas from years ago, and the idea was that, that the ladies used to save the buttons and put them in a bowl, and used to have that. Now, when I when I told my wife that that she can put all the buttons in here, she gave me that look. Are you nuts? You know? <laughs> but that that that's a couple of the things that that I made now. Well, if you can look around in the back, there's nothing but the stuff I made, and um, I love woodworking. Today I was out and I was making some uh, some picture frames, and I lose I lose track of time when I'm out there. Now she calls it the garage, I call it my workshop. Okay, when that garage door goes down, it becomes my workshop. But anyway, I was out there. I went out there. And I, I started working on stuff and I completely lost track of time. You know, that's why I came back in and I got on the computer and a thing came up saying that I had a chat at two o'clock. It's said, oh my goodness. <laughs> but it makes me forget I have Alzheimer's. And that's what, that's what I try to preach. There's things you can do, hobbies you can do, that it's not all doom and gloom. There is life after your diagnosis, but it's up to you to find it. And woodworking might not be your hobby. It could be something else, but do something. Oh, I think everybody has to have a passion, and that's what keeps us busy. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you is how has the woodworking and being able to uh, like you say, get lost in exactly what you're doing, mm -hmm. help kind of deal with the symptoms of, of dementia. It does. It does because um, when you get diagnosed with any form of dementia, you lose your self-worth, okay? You think, oh my goodness, I lost everything. And you need to get stuck on that idea that um, I can't do anything. I'm not the man I used to be. You know, th th those, those kind of nonsense ideas. But when you make a simple thing and you have, you have 20 people say, oh my God, Harry, that's beautiful. Now you don't do it to pat yourself in the back, but you know what? It builds up your ego it lets you know that, that even though I've been living with Alzheimer's for 14 years, it didn't rob me of who I am. And that's what, that's the idea I want to get out to other people that, um, don't sit on it. Don't sit on your couch and wait to die. Do something. Everybody says, well, he has so-and-so dementia. I don't care. Now, 
you get to a point where you lose all your cognitive abilities and you're not able to. I understand that, but that's in the late stages. But too many people give up before their time. That's the people I want to pistol whip to get up off the butt and do something. You know, I believe in tough love, you know, because um, I was like everybody else. When I was diagnosed, I had my pity parties. I, I cried alone. Oh my God, what's going to happen to me? And then you know what? Somebody gave me a kick in the pants and I found out that there is life after your diagnosis. You can be happy. You can laugh. It's okay to laugh. And you know what? It's contagious. Because if you ask anybody to describe Harry, they always say, he's always laughing. <laughs> well, that's true. You know, I, I agree. I went through the same, you know, the same process as you, and, and you do get to that point. Um, does it give you more satisfaction, though, know, when, you, when you create one of your, your gifts for somebody specific, uh, beings that you have maybe a little bit more emotional ties to it? No, I, I have no, I have no emotional ties to anything I make. Now, you have to, you have to realize somebody might say, I might make something like, okay, I made, I made these. Okay, now, so many people say, Harry, can you make me one? Well, yeah, I could, but it's not going to look like this. Because I can't duplicate what I, what I make. You know, it's going to look something like it, but it's not going to look exactly like it. And that's why I get satisfaction in just doing something and somebody says, oh, that's nice. And then I say, would you like to have this? And, you know, you can see the eyes. That's the satisfaction I got, you know, because I put a smile on somebody's face. And I got more out of that than if I would go to a yard sale and sell them. You know, you can't put a price on that. <laughs> what, uh, what is the most, uh, the one thing that you've made that you're most proud of that took the most work in and really kind of taxed you? Well, it, it's kind of, it's kind of, um, it's kind of hard to say because prior to my diagnosis, I was making hutches and I was making furniture and things, things of that sort. Since that, um, I made hundreds of pens. A couple of years ago, I, I must have gave out 40, 50 pens at Christmas time. But I made them out of corn cobs. I made them out of any kind of wood that I could I could come up with, you know, that I put on a lathe and if it looks half decent, I call it a pen. And um, I get a lot of satisfaction out of that. I made, I don't know, 30, 40 snow globes. And of course, none of them look the same, but I mean, that's, that's the fun of it. You know, usually, Usually at Christmas time now, I get in the Christmas spirit in August, uh, simply because um, my birthday is the second second day of August, and uh, my daughter and uh, my son in law they they take I don't drive anymore, so uh, I love Williamsburg. I mean, I, my ashes are going to be spread in Williamsburg, but. Um, we go down there and there's several places I have to see first. And one of them is, is the Christmas mouse. Um, another one is the uh, Yankee Candle Workshop or the Yankee Candle, whatever that's called down there. But it's a huge thing and they have, they have a holiday section 
and Santa Claus is there. Now, I've been going down there so many years, Santa Claus knows me on site. <laughs> and I started, getting into, I started getting into the Christmas spirit at that time, and I say, hey, it's time to get the woodworking. You know, that's when, that's when I pick up. Now, I don't, do, I don't do a lot of woodworking in the summertime when it's hot. You know, if it's nice outside, I'm, out, I'm outdoors. You know, I'm outdoors sitting on my bench, yelling at the squirrels get out of my bird feeders and stuff like that. Um, but come August, that's when I put my, my Santa apron on and I get busy. And it is funny now, so many people, I don't buy wood. So many people give me wood. And it, it's nice because, like, if somebody cuts down a cherry tree, they say, hey, would you like to have some of this cherry wood? And I tell them, well, it can't be any bigger than eight inches round because my lathe won't take anything bigger than that. But that's a branch. That's not the trunk, you know. And most of the branches that people cut down, they, they get they shred up, you know. So they gladly cut them into sections for me and give them to me. So I got piles of wood all over the place that I'm <laughs> that I'm that I'm keeping, but uh, that's that's the fun of it. That's the fun of it. Mm -hmm. Okay, here I got uh, one last question for you. Mm -hmm. If somebody's watching this podcast and and watching you, what would you say to somebody that may just have gotten the news that they have some type of dementia? What would you say to them? I would say to them. Your first impulse is going to be to learn all you want about your disease. Okay? Um, you're going to go out and buy books. You're going to read books. I always tell them, never read the last chapter. Because that, that's always the late stages. And you're not there yet. You know, so don't, don't do that. Um, never give up. That's the most important thing. Now, there's a lot of stigmas and myths that go with this disease, and everybody buys into them. And I'm one of the ones that are breaking down the walls of the steps of me. And when I ask my doctor, how long do I have? Oh, well, you probably have six to eight years. Well, I'm on 14. You know, so, so everybody's different. You know, now if you were living with this disease for 20 years and then get diagnosed, of course, you're not going to have a longevity after that. You know, that's why I say that if you believe you have a problem, get tested as soon as possible. Get it diagnosed in your early stages so you can learn these little secrets I know. And you can live a happy life. Uh, one, okay, one last quick question. Do you, uh, are you going to enter any of your um, articles in the, uh, the DAA uh, art festival? I did, I did last year, I think. Um, the, the, <laughs> the problem I have, as soon as I make them, somebody's knocking on my door, <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> so the, <laughs> now, and, and plus, I have to fight my wife. The words I hear all the time is, "Is that for me?" Well, you know what I'm going to say. <laughs> so I can't. I would like to, Chuck, but I can't. I can't promise you anything, you know, because this this is the Christmas holidays, and, and you know what. I'm, I'm like the shelves in Walmart. It's empty. You know, you can walk through the store, but there's nothing there. <laughs> oh, Harry, thank you so much for coming on. You're, you're such a joy to talk to mm -hmm. and so informative. And the, the artwork that you put out is just gorgeous. Well, thank uh, you for having me. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I'd also like to thank you for joining us today for this Dementia Life. You can view other podcasts on our website, daanow.org, and click on podcasts. 
I'm your host, Chuck McClatchy, and remember, the brain may forget, but the heart remembers. See you next time.